uh, uh, simulated. And you can see it's got a centrally dominant galaxy here, another clump of galaxies here. And as a bit of foreshadowing, it has some nice, interesting arcs of gravitational lensing. But the main point is that, that using the simulations, that is, using the gravity, you can actually build things that look like clusters or galaxies. You make a whole other talk about the fact that the exact same simulation doesn't give you galaxies. That's something that's about that. <coughs> something different. But there's a problem with numerical simulations, which is that you can simulate gravity really well because you know how gravity works perfectly. The problem is no one really knows how galaxies work. We have some idea. We actually have many ideas. But actually saying, putting a, a, you know, to each of those dots in the simulation and saying, this is this type of galaxy, is a very hard problem. So the processes that measure the growth of structure using gravity show you where the mass is, where the gravity is. They don't really tell you where the galaxies are. And, uh, there's actually been a fair amount of advances in the last decade in in what are known as semi-analytic models, where people put in prescriptions that say, well, when the density reaches some threshold, then you'll make stars and you'll see a galaxy. But they're ad hoc. You put them in and you see what comes out. There's no fundamental physics behind it. So the best way to match up, to figure out whether this is the universe you live in, is to compare them to something that uses gravity. And that's where gravitational lensing comes in. Because gravitational lensing is something that uses gravity. It doesn't care about how much light there is. It cares about the mass. And it's basic, basically based on the idea of general relativity that says that the mass bends the space. And the more mass, the more space is curved. And then the curvature of space tells matter what to move, how to move. But it also tells light how to bend. Because it, by curving space, it defines what a straight line is or what a, the shortest path is. And light will take the shortest path. And so the presence of the sun, for example, will bend the position of the star. This is the famous Eddington observation of the 1919 eclipse. Just to illustrate what happens in gravitational lensing, I have here a picture of a quasar and the Earth. And in the case where there's nothing between the quasar and the Earth, the light from the quasar will go to the Earth. Okay, that's so far simple. And therefore, we will see the quasar in the direction <laughs> opposite to the path in which it is. <coughs> but if we now put a galaxy in front of the quasar, what will happen is the light will bend around the galaxy. So the light does a path like this. When we look out from Earth, what we see are rays that diverge, not rays that converge. Even though the lens makes them converge, of course, it makes them converge on us. So from us, our point of view, they diverge. Right, a lot of books get that wrong. Uh, a lot of uh, popular books on uh, light bending get that wrong. Exactly. And the result is that the deflection is away from the right. position of mass, not towards the position right. of mass. The light rays are bent towards you, but your view is bent away. And so right. that's why the larger the mass, the bigger the image separation is. So gravitational lensing is wonderful because it can, for example, create multiple images of a single object. In some cases, you can get many images. You've probably seen this picture. I'm sure I've shown this picture. This is a picture of the cluster 0024 plus 1654, in which there are five separate images of the same galaxy, which happens to have a nice figure eight shape, so it's easily recognizable here, 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 and here. Well, this one's a bit hidden in the galaxy. And so from the fact that you have all these multiple images, you can reconstruct the distribution of mass in this cluster very well. Because you can figure out exactly how much bending you needed to get all these images in the right spot. And so you can make figures like this, this comes from a paper I wrote 10 years ago now, on this cluster, showing the distribution of, of matter in the cluster. And you can see that most of the mass in the cluster is in this uniform component where these are the these spikes are the masses of the individual galaxies, which of course do have mass, and they have a lensing effect as well. Clusters are wonderful from this point of view. But most of the universe, if you look at a random spot in the sky, you won't see a cluster of galaxies. So you'd like to be able to do something 
where you don't have a cluster of galaxies. In that case, you're stuck using weak lensing. In strong lensing, the way you, you solve for the mass is that you figure out where the image would have been if the mass wasn't there. And you can do that because you have two images and you can reconstruct the bending. If you only have one image, you can't go there and take away the mass, so you don't know where the galaxy is. The only thing you do know is that on average, the galaxies shouldn't be oriented any particular way with respect to you, because the galaxies don't really care about Earth. And so there should be just as many galaxies oriented one way as another. But gravitational lensing doesn't just deflect. If your object is extended, if it's a disk rather than a point, the shape is altered. And what happens is that disks become ellipses to first order. And you can use the fact that they become ellipses to measure the amount of mass. Because this amount of ellipticity induced is also proportional to the mass. The catch in all this is that if all galaxies were disks, it would all be easy, but it would all be really boring. Uh, galaxies aren't round disks. Some of them you see face on, and they look kind of disk-like. But some of them you see edge on. The key, the thing that makes gravitational lensing possible, is not that they're all disks, but they are randomly oriented. There are just as many oriented this way as this way, intrinsically. And so any overabundance of one orientation is a signature of gravitational lensing. So the key is you have to average over many galaxies. And this is possible because if you look, this is a weird cartoon. I've used this a couple times. It's always a little bit awkward. The, the, uh, this was done by the PR department at Bell Labs when I was a postdoc there. I guess they were used to biological systems, so the, the, the yeah. matter system was kind of like amoebas. But the, the, the idea behind this picture is that if you have distant galaxies, the light from distant galaxies actually, that are near each other on the sky actually travels through relatively similar paths in coming to you. And so they're distorted in similar ways. And that means if you take a small enough patch of the sky, the shapes will correlate and you can average. If you take a patch that's too big, well, you'll be averaging this with this, and the correlation will go away. Okay. So what do you need to actually do this experiment? Well, you need deep imaging, because you need to find the galaxies that are behind the masses you want. Gravitational lensing is independent of light only in the sense that you don't care about the light of, that's associated with the mass. But if you don't have any galaxies, you can't detect any signal. The more objects you have, the more averaging you can do, and the better the map you can make. You need good seeing because you need to measure the shape. And well, if you want to do a lot of them, it's not really a survey if you don't do a large area. It's called a pencil beam. So the project that I've is almost finished doing it started off as a five-year program, it's now a six and a half year program. And the idea is that we're going to take images of seven patches of the sky, each about uh, 16 times the area of the full moon, in four filters, with exposure times of about five hours per patch of the sky, depending on the filter. And we would pick one filter to observe in good seeing, because that would allow us to get the best, most uniform image quality. <coughs> this is a pretty big team. Uh, the PIs are myself. Tony Tyson and Dave Whitman, who are both at, now at UC Davis, but were at Bell Labs when we started. And people have been shuffling places all over the place, including Rob Pike, who went from Bell Labs to Google, uh, and is still involved in this project. And uh, a couple of my postdocs, or my grad students, one of whom is now a postdoc at Fermilab. What we've done, what we're doing, <coughs> is we take <coughs> four-meter telescopes. The Blanco four-meter at CTIO, the Mayall four-meter at Kipik, these are no longer the big telescopes. In the world of professional astronomy, the big telescopes are 8 and 10 meter telescopes. The 4 meters are the small